Welcome, uh, dear students and colleagues and young intensivists, uh, to today's uh, critical case under webinar on our forum, Young India Intensivist. It is an indeed a great pleasure and honor to have a very distinguished faculty, Professor Lauren Brosha from Canada, one of the leading authorities in respiratory critical care, to speak to us today and enlighten us and educate us. We are very thankful to you, sir. Thanks a lot. And uh, the topic today is how to set PEEP. A uh, very enigmatic topic, a debatable topic, and something where we continue to strive forward. So I'll just introduce sir to you, all of you. Most of you know him. You know He's an international expert and has contributed greatly to our understanding of respiratory critical care. And just to share his great work with you, I'll just take a minute. Thank you so much for the, the kind introduction. So one minute, sir. sir. I just introduce you. Okay. So Professor Lauren Brosha is director and head interdepartmental division of critical care medicine, University of Toronto, Canada. He's Keenan Chair in Critical Care and Respiratory Medicine, scientist in the Keenan Research Center for Biomedical Science at St. Michael's Hospital, clinical scientist, critical care department, St. Michael's Hospital. Deputy Editor of the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, which is the leading journal in critical care medicine. And he was a former editor-in-chief of Intensive Care Medicine Journal, which is again one of the leading journals that we have in intensive care. He's head of the Plug Working Group on Plural Pressure for European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. He's former head and member of the REVA, the European Research Network on Mechanical Ventilation. He's member of the Canadian Critical Care Trial Group. And astoundingly, that is his great work, more than 500 research papers with H index of greater than 92 and greater than 10,000 citations. So that is indeed remarkable. And we are really honored to have uh, Dr. Prof. Dr. Lauren Prochar speak to us today. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks again for the invitation. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, I'm really Pleased to um, to share this uh, presentation with you today. I think your format is really great, and uh, hope that my um, contribution will be helpful. Because, uh, as you say, the topic is not a new one. We we are still uh, struggling about uh, discussing how best to titrate PEEP after a number of uh, randomized trials, and. I think we have new data and new ways to understand the way PEEP is working. So I'm really pleased to share that with you today. So um, my laboratory is working with a number of companies. We, we got research grants and uh, equipment. They are listed here. And um, I will start by saying, uh, First, we, we need to know why we want to use PEEP, and there are different kinds of indications. So I think uh, most people will think about PEEP for alveolar recruitment, and I will spend uh, some time discussing that. But PEEP is also useful to combat just simple atelectasis, which is also very, very relevant for most of our patients in the ICU. I will develop the concept that PEEP may be useful to keep the airways open, not only the lung, but the airways, when you have this phenomenon called airway closure. And I will very briefly describe why PEEP has a special effect in a uh, case of obesity. I won't have time. We can do it uh, in the discussion if you want to discuss uh, intrinsic PEEP and heart failure, where PEEP has also um, very interesting indications. So let me start with alveolar recruitment, which is often discussed, but uh, is sometimes a bit um, confusing to understand what we mean. And this is a really nice illustration. We have uh, taken it from the we have modified a um, photograph from the first edition of the handbook of physiology. Um, and what you see at the top is the uh, photo of a lung, which has been put outside of the thorax. So you see the first uh, 
image indicate that the lung is completely deflated. And then the lung is progressively inflated until it reopens. And the lung is now deflated, so back to, to zero. And you see the different levels of pressure which are needed to get each uh, image. And as you can see, it's really striking to see that for the same pressure during deflation, you have much more volume than during inflation. And the way to represent it at the same time is to draw a relationship between the pressure. So this is the bottom of the slide, the pressure in the system and the volume inflated. And as you can see during inflation, the first part is almost flat. So there is very little volume in, in uh, unless there is a, a certain pressure reach, then you inflate the lung. And then during deflation, during expiration, if you want, for any pressure in the system, you have much more volume. And this is in part due to the properties of surfactant and the difference between the two curves have been called the hysteresis. But when you look at the photograph, you see this is uh, exactly what we have in mind when we speak of recruitment. Recruitment is reopening some parts of the lung which were not ventilated and keeping the lung open to have more volume for the same pressure. So the concept of having more volume for the same pressure is really the fundamental aspect of what we are trying to evaluate at the bedside. And I will show you the techniques which can be used now to uh, clinically assess this uh, recruitment. Um, and of course, you know, an important question for clinicians, which has been discussed since many years is, uh, is that synonymous to the best compliance? And so we, we recently published this uh, review article, and I'm happy to uh, send this article for, for the group, saying setting PEEP does the best compliance concept really work? And I will show you a number of examples where unfortunately, the best PEEP, if you want, uh, if we can de describe that, is not always the best compliance. So in this paper, we discuss techniques, which uh, I will describe today and which have been very useful to understand better uh, why we can try to find a better PEEP and why it's not always the best compliance. So I will describe the recruitment to inflation ratio which I think is a very simple technique that anyone can use uh, in the ICU. And I will talk about a new imaging technique called electrical impedance tomography. Uh, even if you don't have this technique in your ICU, you will see it brings really uh, important uh, consideration for management of patients in general. So maybe you know, the first reason why we ask this question, does best PEEP correlate with best compliance is because we have data, clinical trials data, showing the opposite. Um, you probably all know this study, which was called the ART trial, uh, where it's a study uh, performed in Brazil, and they try to see if uh, higher PEEP could be beneficial in patients with ARDS. Um, so I have I used to say that it's not a study of low PEEP versus high PEEP, but it's a study of high PEEP versus very high PEEP. And in the very high PEEP group, they tried everything possible to reopen the lung and keep the lung open by, by keeping high PEEP. So when I say everything, this included very aggressive recruitment maneuver. And as you can see on this slide, this is mortality. And mortality 
was higher in the group with very high PIP, which was titrated to have the best compliance. So definitely we can say the best compliance may not be the optimal technique for titrating PIP, at least in this study, which may be confounded by the effect of uh, recruitment maneuver because they, it was very aggressive, uh, but that does not show benefit and even show some harm. So let me start before going to alveolar recruitment by atelectasis. Why do I think this is really important? Atelectasis is the loss of lung volume, which is not aerated and which can be reopened by pressure. And we know from a very long time, uh, this is uh, one of the seminal study by uh, the physiologist Goran Edenstirner in, in anesthesiology 1985, that when you give general anesthesia, so meaning you put the patient or the, the the, the healthy subject flat in a bed with sedation, intubation, and sometimes paralysis, you generate anesthesia. And of course, the FiO2 plays a role too. And you, you generate atelectasis. And this atelectasis may be a loss of lung volume of 20 to 30%. So this decreased compliance, this increased the pressure on the ventilator, this increased the risk of ventilator induced lung injury. Uh, and this is probably a, a big part of the postoperative complications. But just remember that when we put any patient in the ICU under mechanical ventilation, that's what we do. We, we gave them sedation, we put them on, on uh, lying in a flat in a bed, and sometimes we give paralysis. This creates atelectasis, and you need some PIP to counteract this atelectasis generated by your anesthesia. So that's, I think, a very important concept to say there is a, always a minimal PIP needed. In addition, when you have massive atelectasis, um, this has a deleterious effect on the right ventricle. This was a, a series of studies done by Brian Cavanaugh in Toronto and his team. So these are experimental studies, uh, but he was looking at the effect of the of atelectasis on the right ventricle. And you, you can see on the this is echo images and the, on the right part you see the right ventricle impairment score and when there is massive atelectasis uh, it goes up and after recruitment of this atelectasis you have less impairment of the right ventricle so mm -hmm. keep also that in mind it's also important to have PEEP to reduce the amount of collapse and atelectasis and that will be beneficial for the right heart we know that excessive pressure and volume can be bad for the right heart, but insufficient pressure also. So the next step when above the PEEP you need to combat atelectasis and um, massive collapse is to know whether your lung is recruitable or not. And unfortunately, this concept has not been applied in any of the randomized trials, including the R trial, which I showed you, which to me is a major limitation of these trials because it, it was simply applying a high PEEP or a low PEEP, whatever the recruitability of the lung. How can we assess recruitability? Well, I'm going to show you a technique which we designed in Toronto with uh, uh, my colleague, my colleague Lou Chen, which we call the recruitment to inflation ratio. And I tried to convince you that it can be used in any ICU on any ventilator 
um, almost any ventilator uh, with a simple maneuver at the bedside. So, as you know, to measure recruitment, the uh, let's say the gold standard technique which has been used in research has been the CT scan. And you have here an example of a CT where the lung is reopened with high pressure. So that's not exactly what we discussed of the concept of recruitment. That's really reopening under high pressure. But this is very complex. This needs several uh, levels of pressure in the CT scan. And the analysis to uh, quantify this is really complex. So a second technique is the pressure volume curve. And I've shown you in my first slide what it means in terms of reopening part of the lung. But for the pressure volume curve technique to measure recruitment, you need several curves. For instance, in this example, you have one curve starting from a peep of five and the second curve starting from a peep of 15. And what we are looking for is whether the second curve starts with a higher volume uh, than the initial curve. Remember this concept of having more volume in the system for the same pressure. So this difference here between the two curves is what we are looking for, the alveolar recruitment. So the, the, the um, important point here is to be sure you can place the two curves above FRC. So you need to know how much volume you got in the system. And of course, you can measure the absolute lung volume, but that's really complicated in the ICU. And what you can do is do a simple maneuver, long expiration to zip or to a low peep, because the ventilator will measure the volume expired, and that will help you to place these two curves. But it's still a bit complex, and this is why we design a simple technique. So this is the schema of this simple technique. It's one breath, one maneuver. So you are going to go from a peep of 15 to a peep of 5 and ask the question when I drop my peep, do I see de-recruitment? So is my peep of 15 able to recruit part of the lung? The uh, first thing you need to do is to reduce the respiratory rate for a couple of breaths so you're sure there is no auto peep in the system. And then you will drop the peep in one breath and measure the expired volume on the ventilator. So you need a ventilator which gives you breast by breast the um, expired volume, but uh, um, most of the ventilators do that. So if you wish, this is a, the, the same thing here. Uh, when you read the expired volume, you have three parts. You have the volume which was insufflated, so you need to subtract that. And then in the blue, you have the volume which was trapped by PEEP from 15 to 5. And this has two components. One is simply the volume predicted by the compliance at low PIP. So you need to measure the compliance at low PIP, which is simply measuring the plateau pressure and the uh, volume, because it tells you how much of the volume is due simply to insufflation of the baby lung. And any difference between this predicted volume by the compliance and the total volume measured indicates that you had recruited the lung and that now you're losing lung volume. Okay, let me show you how to do it in real time. So I'm going to share a video with you. Um, to, If you want to review this video, go to this web page, rtmaven.com, RT like respiratory therapy, maven.com. And you will see this video. You will see also a calculator, which will help you for the calculation of the recruitment to inflation ratio. So I'm going to play this video, which will show you in real time how to do the maneuver. 
Can you co confirm you hear the sound? Okay, so this was the maneuver in real time. Can everybody confirm that you, you could hear the sound? Sound uh, couldn't be heard, sir. There was no sound. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So as you can see, this is a very simple maneuver. And again, if you if you forget, go to this web page and you will see how to do it. Uh, you, you see the example with this ventilator, but you can do with any ventilator. So very simple maneuver which will tell you, and I, I will come back to that, if your lung is recruitable or not recruitable. So it gives you a direction how to set P. However, before doing this maneuver, you need to look for something else. And I mentioned that very early in my talk, this uh, other thing you need to look at is called airway closure. Because this is a a natural phenomenon. You know, when you try to empty your lungs, you, at some time, your airways will close, even if your lung has still air, and this is called the residual volume. So that's a natural phenomenon. But we have observed that uh, in many situations, uh, either in non-intubated patients uh, with, with some disease or in intubated patients, the level of airway closure, the, the volume of airway closure can be much higher than the CRF. In other terms, you may need to have positive pressure to reopen the airway. So the airways may be closed, whereas the lung is still inflated. So how to see that? Well, if you look, for instance, on the left, at the this pressure volume curve, right? This relationship between increase in pressure and increase in volume. In many patients, you will see that that as soon as you increase volume, you increase pressure, and there is a. It's not completely linear, but a more or less linear relationship. But in other patients, you will see that in the first part. Uh, it's almost flat. So the pressure goes up, but the volume does not go up. Let me show you another example. This is a patient, for instance, we start at zero, almost no inflation, and then abruptly you see an increase in volume. Same patient, we start from eight, nothing, and then abruptly an increase in volume. And then when we start from 16, you see the increase in volume immediately. So in these patients, what we call the airway opening pressure, so to reopen the airway, was 16. And, and the last graph is a patient without airway closure. So in some patients, the airway opening pressure, many of them, it will be between 5 and 15, but in some of them, it may be higher than 15. Uh, and in the very sick patients or in the obese patients, you may have very high airway opening pressure. So why is it a problem? Um, it, it's a problem because uh, if, if you keep the airway closed for a long time, you will have a reabsorption of the oxygen, it's called denitrogenation atelectasis, so this will create more atelectasis, and it may be also injurious for the small airway to open and close every time. So if you see that, it's probably much better to have a, a PEEP set at the minimal level at the airway opening pressure. 
Um, there is a simpler way, again, I'm always trying to find simple technique to be used at the bedside to do it instead of the pressure volume curve, which is again a bit complicated. You can do simply a low flow inflation maneuver. Okay, so that would be what you can see on the screen of your ventilator during normal assist control ventilation. And that would be a low flow inflation where you set the flow very low. And you see on this curve that the initial part of the increase in pressure is very steep. And if you have the esophageal pressure, which is not needed, but here, you see that there is no increase in lung volume before this point. So this is where the airways open, and then you have an inflation. We don't know where the airways closed. In, in ICU patients, sometimes it may be a central airway, like a closure of the trachea or the main bronchi. In other patients, it may be more distal. Again, I'm not going to show the video, but if you go on a web page, you will see how to do it. Uh, first, decrease the respiratory rate to have a long inflation, and then go for a, a, a flow. So you need a very low respiratory rate, a flow of less than 10 liters per minute. And you can see this, uh, this abrupt uh, change in the slope of, of pressure increase. So it doesn't need to be pressure volume, just pressure time may be sufficient. And there is a, even a simpler technique. If you have uh, waveforms on the screen of your ventilator, uh, again, on the left, this is the low flow inflation that I just show you. On the top is a patient with no airway closure, so no airway opening pressure. Uh, the second curve would be a patient with airway opening pressure. So if you look at uh, the waveform in conditions of classical assist control ventilation, that's what you usually see. You see that the resistive pressure, which can be measured by a plateau at the end of insufflation, so the difference between peak and plateau, uh, is very similar to the initial rise in airway pressure. If you have a relatively high flow, it's easy to see. But if your patient has an airway opening pressure needed to be open before insufflating the lung, you will see that the initial part here is much higher than the last part here. So visually, you, you can detect very quickly that your patient has airway opening pressure. And let's say it's not every patient. In ARDS patients, the studies show it's approximately in, in one third of the patients, maybe sometimes a bit higher. Uh, so it's not in every patient, but if you if you do the maneuver, which I described to you, the drop in 15 to 5, you need to know if you the 5 is below the airway opening pressure or not. Okay, Because if, you, if your airway opening pressure is 10 and you drop the pressure from 15 to 5, in fact, in reality, you only drop it from 15 to 10. Okay? So to measure the recruitability, first, determine if there is airway opening pressure, and second, do this simple uh, one breast maneuver. Uh, just to say, this technique has been now used by many people. Uh, initially, we validate, validated the technique, so this is the correlation with change in oxygenation, which of course is not perfect, because we know oxygenation is not perfect. Uh, this is the relationship with the change in dead space, alveolar dead space. And you see the more recruitable is the lung, uh, the best you decrease the alveolar dead space. Uh, this is the value of the recruitment to inflation ratio from zero to two. Some patients may have even higher value. And we think that when this ratio is higher than 0.5, some people say 0.7, the lung is highly recruitable. Uh, it has also been validated against the lung ultrasound score, uh, the re aeration score. So the higher the recruitment to inflation ratio, the higher the 
re-aeration you see with ultrasound. And more recently, it has been uh, validated with this new technique I'm going to describe, the electrical impedance tomography. So if I, if I was going to stop here, I would say, please use this technique to ask whether my patient is recruitable. As I said in the beginning, you always need some PID to combat atelectasis and uh, um, avoid massive lung collapse. But then to go above, you say, is my patient is recruitable? So if the patient is not recruitable, meaning the R2I ratio is below 0.5, just use the minimal acceptable PID, maybe 8, maybe 10, and that will be don't try to go above because you will mostly induce harm. If your patient is recruitable, for instance, your recruitment to inflation ratio is close to one or higher, yes, you can try to increase PEEP, maybe until a plateau pressure limit is reached, like 28 centimeters of water. Uh, you should also check the other parameters like driving pressure, hemodynamics, and PCO2. Or you can also use a more uh, sophisticated or let's say uh, detailed method like electrical impedance tomography, which I'm going to describe now. So electrical impedance tomography is, is a new technique, which um, is not, I know is not available everywhere, but you will see it gives really a, uh, important insights into the lung because it gives an image which is a functional image so it's not anatomical it's functional it's where the ventilation goes in real time at the bedside so you see where the the, the ventilation goes uh, it presents like a, a ct slice if you wish and you can see, for instance, in this patient, there is a real, real big asymmetry between the two lungs. And this can be transformed into numbers, calculations. So let me show you an example of um, the, um, the insights which have been brought by this technique. This is an experimental study which we did in Toronto with Boucher and Katira. Um, sorry, I'm going to start here. And big, we had EIT. So with EIT, we could look at what happens in the um, in the upper part of the lung, which is the non-dependent part, and the lower part of the lung, which is the dependent part. And this is a decremental PEEP trial. You see from 2019, 18, etc. So in, in experimental studies, we can do what we want. And you see, this is the uh, maybe the, the curve on the top is the compliance. And in this experimental study, you clearly see a best compliance, which is around 15 or 16 of P. Okay. But then when you divide the lungs in two parts, the dependent part, so the lower part, the dorsal part, well, you see it, it matches with the compliance. It's about, uh, again, the best regional compliance, about 15 or 16. But when you now look at the other part of the lung, the ventral part, the non-dependent part, you see that the best compliance is around seven or eight centimeters of water. And every time you increase PEEP above seven or eight, the only thing you do is to distend the lung, to distend this part of the lung. And that's not something you, you can see with compliance. So that's one of the reasons, for instance, compliance, the global compliance may not indicate the best PEEP for your whole lung. And it was very interesting in this study because we also looked at prone positioning, and you can see when prone, the, the lung is, is put in the other situation, there is a different configuration. And you see the two curves, the dependent part, the non-dependent part, are now almost superimposed. So the best PEEP for each part is almost the same. 
which is an enormous advantage of proning. That's why prone is such a, a beautiful technique uh, to reduce the risk of ventilator lung injury because you you reduce this risk of uh, distension or under collapse. So the way it is used is, you, is usually in, in clinical setting to do a decremental PIP titration. And the advantage of this technique is that it can give an idea of uh, the pixel by pixel compliance. And when the compliance increases with less PIP, it means that the, the pixel was distended. And when the compliance increased uh, decrease with less PIP, it means that now the, the this pixel is collapsed. So you can obtain a curve of collapse and distension for every pixel, and you can you can sh show something like that, which is the curve of over the decremental PIP trial of um, uh, collapse in in white and of distension in red. And because we don't know what's the best, whether it's more important to decrease collapse or to avoid distension, one solution is to, for instance, put your PEEP at the intersection between the two curves, so which would minimize both collapse and distension. And we recently published a, a large study in COVID patients um, uh, with more than 100 patients uh, studied with EIT. Uh, you see, this is the percentage of decrease in collapse when we go from 24 to 6 of PEEP, uh, again showing the large variability across patients. We use this technique, so this is the example of patients with a low recruiter on the left. Uh, you see only uh, maybe 7 or 8 of PEEP is, is sufficient to um, minimize both collapse and distension. And this would be an example of a high recruiter where the crossing point would be around 15. And we found that we could uh, classify all our patients, and we uh, found three groups of patients, patients with low recruitability. The mean PEEP was around 10. Patients with medium recruitability, the mean PEEP was around 13. And patients with high recruitability, the mean PEEP was around 15.5. And what was remarkable with this technique is that whatever the recruitability, if you choose a crossing point, you know that you will be at, at a reasonably low level of both collapse and distension, like less than 10%. So really a very interesting technique if you have it to go for a more detailed individual titration of P. And coming back to my initial question, is that the same than best compliance? You see the the individual relationship between the crossing point and the best compliance. And it's a bit all over the place. It's not the same value. Sometimes it's the same value, but very often it's either higher or lower. So again, the best compliance is not the best technique. And to finish this part, I, I will show you very briefly some data which have not been uh, published yet. We, we did an experimental study where we compared three strategies of setting PEEP. One, using this crossing point. One, where we say what we want is to minimize distension. We think the, the more risky is, the, is distension, so let's minimize distension. And one where we say, no, what we want to do is to minimize collapse. That's the most risky. And in fact, we don't know what's the most risky collapse or distension. So we randomize uh, the animals in three groups. Um, let's say a high PEEP to minimize collapse, a low PEEP to minimize distension, and the crossing point. And this is the first result we obtained. Look at the, so the animals were randomized in three groups. Remember the low PEEP, so where we want to minimize distension, we had a very high mortality, 50% mortality compared to 100% survival in the two other groups. And why did, sorry, why did the, the mortality was high? Uh, 
we think it's because of right ventricular failure. You see the, the dose of epinephrine, which was needed in, in the um, groups with the low collapse was much higher. Um, and with, sorry, low distension was much higher. So we think we reproduce the negative effect of uh, excessive collapse on the right ventricle. And this is why uh, there's such a high mortality. So when we look at the, the mechanics uh, and oxygenation in the three groups, you see that the low over distension group, again, uh, low, uh, low PEEP, uh, was worse every time. More driving pressure, higher shunt, lower oxygenation, and lower compliance. The two other groups, which were the crossing points and the high uh, PEEP for low collapse, were, were very similar. And remember, this is a very recruitable model. And when we look for differences between the two uh, groups, low, low um, collapse versus crossing points, we found some difference, not massive difference, but some difference, uh, for instance, in terms of alveolar density uh, in the group at the crossing point, the lung was more homogeneous. There was no difference between dependent and non-dependent. And there was less protein content, so probably less inflammation, suggesting that the best technique from this data, at least, may be the crossing point. Okay, so from this data, we could say, well, if we think of the optimal PEEP, uh, there is no unique optimal PEEP for all regions of the lung, so you need to make compromise. Uh, it's really important to know if the lung is recruitable or not, so that's where we can use the recruitment to inflation ratio. As you have seen, insufficient PEEP can have serious negative consequences on the right ventricle. And EIT may offer an optimal compromise for PEEP titration. So very quickly to finish, uh, just show you two examples where another technique can really be interesting, which is the esophageal pressure. Um, the first one is, is obesity. In obese patients, as you can see, the pressure inside the chest is significantly higher as the body mass index increases. So this is the weight of the, of the chest wall and the abdominal content pushing on the chest and explaining that the end expiratory esophageal pressure goes up. So in a, in a normal subject, it would be a relatively low value, below 10 centimeters of water, but it can go as high, high, high as 20 centimeters of water in obese patients. So for these patients, knowing the intrathoracic pressure may be very useful to counteract this external pressure on the system. So it's not so much to recruit the lung, it's really to avoid atelectasis due to the effect of the chest wall and the abdomen when the patient is, is sedated. Uh, you, you will also see much more frequent airway closure. For instance, in this series, we found that patients with BMI more than 40 had 60% of airway closure, so very frequent. And it's also more frequent in the sickest patients, the very sick patients. So in this situation, a very interesting technique is the esophageal pressure. Uh, which you know can be measured with an esophageal catheter. And this technique has been proposed in ARDS patients to, and is illustrated here. You see, uh, you see the pressure on the ventilator on the top. In the middle, you have the esophageal pressure, which in this case has an N expiratory value around maybe 14 centimeters of water. And what the authors propose, this is the first study by Danny Talmor and his group, was to set the PEEP to get um, no difference between PEEP and N uh, expiratory esophageal pressure, which means a transpulmonary pressure close to zero. So I think this concept is very interesting, but it's especially interesting uh, 
I, th I think you still need to know if the lung is rotable or not to do that. And it's especially interesting when you expect a high intrathoracic pressure, like in obese patients. And, and this will be just my final uh, comment. Uh, it may also be useful in case of very asymmetrical lung injury. Again, this is a, a well-known clinical problem where the two lungs may not be injured in the same way. Um, again, we, we did this experimental study. You see the distribution of the tidal volume. Again, this is from a PEEP zero on the right to a PEEP of 20. At the PEEP of zero, you see that most of the ventilation, 70% or more, is going into the non-injured lung because it's, it's much easier to inflate. And with higher PEEP, you progressively uh, equilibrate the distribution of ventilation. But how do you do it? You do it because this is data obtained with CT scan. At first, let's say from zero to 10 of PEEP, you decrease the collapse. This is the collapse of the uh, injured lung. But when you go above 10 of PEEP, what you mostly do is to distend the non-injured lung. And that's, you know, you see that the distribution of ventilation is more equal, but this is because you mostly distend the non-injured lung. And what was interesting in this study was to show that if, if you use the n expiratory transpulmonary pressure, so the technique I just described to you, um, measuring the esophageal pressure and looking at the difference with airway pressure. Again, the best PEEP was for an N expiratory transpulmonary pressure uh, around zero, which would help you to recruit the collapsed lung, the injured lung, but help you to avoid distending too much the non-injured uh, lung. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. I, I know it's a lot of information but I think it's uh, uh, really new and important information, which hopefully can be used at the bedside. And I will be very happy to address any questions you have. Um, and and please, uh, please take note of our web page where you can see the video I showed you, as well as the address of our blog. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Boucher for a lovely talk and, you know, updating the latest in the field of PEEP. So while we wait for any questions from the audience, uh, I will just put up some questions. So a very basic questions uh, about the Berlin definition. And now again, we have the ESICM update on ARDS. Why is a PEEP of five still used uh, or actually used for classifying ARDS, you know? Well, that's a good question. In fact, it's... Uh... You know, it started from the Berlin definition because uh, when uh, people wanted to validate the Berlin definition, in most of the database from from randomized study, the minimal PEEP was always five. So th that's uh, that's why it was uh, proposed initially because the data which were used to validate the definition had always at least a PEEP of five. Uh, but, you know, the new definition is saying we don't need this PEEP of five. Uh, and in fact, for instance, if your patient is on high flow nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula is providing some pressure, which is equivalent maybe to a PEEP of five. So you can, you can uh, make the diagnosis of ARDS in a patient of high flow without having a, a formal PEEP of five. Thank you. Then uh, coming uh, to the inclusion of PEEP in the mechanical power equation. Uh, so your comments on that, because that is just a one-time thing that you do. No? You said the PEEP, but it's included in the equation. So any comments on that? Sir? Yeah, so what is the, what is the, um, what I'm uncomfortable with in the power equation is that as I try to show you need some PEEP. You need some PEEP initially to uh, uh, to 
limit atelectasis and to help the right ventricle. So that's very important. If you think of the way PEEP is introduced in the power equation, you would say, well, the lower the PEEP, the lower the power. But, but uh, to me, that's a bit dangerous to think like that because uh, some PEEP is absolutely needed, it's crucial. So it's true that if you go too high on the PEEP, um, you, you may be harmful, but it depends on the recruitability. So I think the effect of PEEP are complex you need minimal levels of PEEP, and then the PEEP will be useful only if the lung is recruitable. And all these effects are not introduced in the power equation. So, so I'm not sure, you know, in the power equation, I think the most important is driving pressure, which is, you, you can look at it without the power. And the second important part is the respiratory rate. And there are Simple, simpler formula to use at these two combined driving pressure and respiratory rate uh, because the power is in a way it's a complicated equation but the 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 way it introduced PEEP is is uh, is not correct I think. Thank you. So then just talking about driving pressure you know, one of the arguments against driving pressure is that you may get a driving pressure of less than 13 with a PEEP of less than 5 or a PEEP of even more than 15. And, you know, in ARDS, we generally keep a PEEP of between 5 and 15 unless the patient is obese or chest wall compliance is less. So any comments on that, sir, that you can get a driving pressure of less than 13 with a PEEP of less than 5 or even more than 15 in some patients? So I would say the driving pressure is a fantastic tool, very simple especially for titrating tidal volume. So for titrating tidal volume is absolutely excellent. And uh, you, you, if you have set, you know, uh, standard uh, ventilation with six ml per kilogram, and if your driving pressure is 20, I think it makes sense to try to reduce the tidal volume and to, to reduce your driving pressure. The effect of PEEP on driving pressure, it's like the effect of PEEP on compliance. It's a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, if you have a, if your lung is, is, you know, collapsing and reopening, collapsing and reopening, when you measure driving pressure during insufflation, it will look like it's, it's good because when you reopen the lung, your driving pressure is lower. But in fact, you are doing what we call tidal recruitment. Mm -hmm. So I would say when you set PEEP and your driving pressure uh, goes up a lot by, by, you know, five centimeters of water, I think it's bad. You, you should stop. But if it increases by one or two centimeters of water, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily bad. And that's where we have this difference between driving pressure compliance and the optimal PEEP. So, so I would say driving pressure, excellent for titrating tidal volume. Be a bit more careful for uh, uh, PEEP. Thank you. Then uh, it's about uh, setting of PEEP in ARDS patients of obesity. Uh, ideally, one should be using an esophageal catheter, but um, many ICUs don't have esophageal catheters. So, any guidance uh, on how to how much we can go up on the PEEP and plat plateau pressure, sir? Any, whether it depends on the BMI or what what kind of guidance can you give? And especially yeah, if, very... if the pleural pressure goes up, the cardiac output also gets decreased. You know, so yeah. So that's a very interesting point. In fact, it has been shown that so. So that you have two phenomena, right? You have one, which is the, the weight of the abdomen and the chest wall, so which makes your pressure in the chest very high. And therefore, you need to counteract this pressure, for sure. The second phenomenon is that you also have airway closure. So your, your, what you measure at the airway opening may not be the alveolar pressure. And my recommendation is that, so let's say the higher the BMI, the higher maybe the intrathoracic pressure. And you can go up slowly on the PEEP and look at the hemodynamics. 
you will be surprised that the patients who have very high intrathoracic pressure at baseline, they will tolerate extremely well, very high PEEP. Okay, because their pressure is already high. You don't know it, but it's already high. So you don't have the usual effect of increasing PEEP, which usually, you know, decrease your blood pressure. So you will see that these patients, you don't know what's the intrathoracic pressure if you cannot measure it, but you will see that increasing PEEP, there is no change in blood pressure. So if there is no change in blood pressure, you can be really reassured and uh, you, it may be, you may need to go to 15 to 20, sometimes to 25 in, in the very obese patients and look at the hemodynamic. That will be your, your main uh, surrogate to say that this is safe. Thank you, sir. So then I think a final question, uh, there are no questions from the audience so far. So the effect of PEEP on uh, cardiac output, you know, the, if you increase PEEP, the cardiac output decreases and that decreases the delivery of oxygen. But at the same time, the shunt fraction also decreases with the increase of PEEP. So what is the overall effect of PEEP on delivery of oxygen to the tissues? Is it, you just have to see what it is or? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So, and we tend to forget that, that when we, we increase PEEP, even if we don't recruit the lung. So especially if you don't recruit the lung, if you don't recruit the lung with PEEP, you will markedly distend the, the lung which is open, and this will have a huge hemodynamic effect. And as, as you said, that's completely correct. If you decrease cardiac output, you, you will decrease shunt, which means that there, there will be less blood going into the non aerated areas. It will go more in the aerated areas. So, so your oxygenation, your PaO2 will go up. However, when you calculate the oxygen delivered to the tissue, which is the, depends on cardiac output and oxygen content, um, you will have mostly an effect of low cardiac output. So you will decrease the oxygen delivery. That's one of the reasons why oxygenation, unfortunately, is not a good surrogate for recruitment. Of course, if you have more recruitment, you will have more oxygenation, that's sure. But you may have better oxygenation with no recruitment. That's why we need other techniques than oxygenation to set P. And the risk is that you increase oxygenation but decrease delivery and you, you're, you're not doing any good for your patients and you're harming the lung. So that's why it's really, we all look at oxygenation, this is really important, but this is not sufficient and you need to have a, a marker that what you are doing is good for your lung is, you know, initially we were measuring cardiac output, but I, I think in many patients, we don't measure cardiac output. But if you were measuring cardiac output, you could calculate the oxygen delivery and see that it's going down. So my suggestion is to say, be sure that your lung is recruitable. So what you do will not be too harmful for the the circulation and will be beneficial for the lung. Thank you. Sir. So I think uh, with that, we come to an end of our session. Thank you very much, Professor Lauren Brochard, sir. It was indeed an honor and a pleasure and great uh, listening to you on PEEP. And uh, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel for all the intensivists across the globe to listen to and to learn from. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much.